All right, so we are going to have another long video um, because I am talking about an entire genre again. Yesterday, we talked about mysteries and I did a, a series of case studies and I'm going to do the same again today so that we can look at the pieces that you must have in order to make your novel unputdownable and see them in action to see whether or not we can get some of these pennies to drop for you. So yesterday, we talked about mysteries um, which tend to be heavier on the plot than the story. So more stuff happens than reactions happen, although you need both of these things. The other biggest seller, as we know, is romance. Outsells everything by far in the literary market. Uh, sorry, by literary, I mean in the novel market, not just literary fiction. Um, so literary upmarket and genre fiction, absolutely, outsells, in all category, outsells everything else. And in the plot story balance, romance is much, much more story driven because we have to know the why. We know the what. Just as in a mystery, we know the what. We know that someone has been killed, a crime has been committed, um, there are baddies on the loose, the mafia is doing something. We know the what, and we need to understand the why. But the what is pretty heavy in the, the mystery genre, this big, big genre. In romance, we know the what even more clearly, right? Two people, usually, not always, and we'll dig into that in a minute, fall in love, and there is some barrier to that. And the barrier could be external. So, you know, we're thinking about Bollywood movies where the Romeo and Juliet, where it is forbidden, it's actually forbidden, um, a discovery of witches, the uh, two species aren't supposed to intermingle. Um, what else? Poldark, he has gone off to war. And when he comes back, his true love, who did not believe he was coming back because he's been away for six years, um, believed that he was dead and gone, has up and and gotten engaged or married to. Anyway, is with his cousin. Um, and so they're separated. They're separated by something that cannot be surmounted, except it must be, right? Because it's a romance. And one of the defining characteristics of romance is there is a happy ever after. If there is not a happy ever after or happy for now, you are in a different genre. You will be crucified if you do not deliver on what romance readers like and expect and know. I believe that everybody should study romance because, uh, and I happen to know that John Truby agrees with me. Um, he said, not this year, but last year, he said that romance is the hardest genre to write in because your characters want each other. I mean, in, in a lot of drama, what your character wants is impeded by something that absolutely blocks them from having it. Um, but here, the block should be something that they can overcome, right? Because they want each other. Um, so terrific, terrific genre to study. I think everyone should write a romance to show you just how hard it is. Um, it gets bashed a lot. I'm just going to talk a little bit about romance bashing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, I think that there are a bunch of different reasons. Um, and I think it's very, very sad because being in love, falling in love, loving other people, is just one of the great human experiences. And I think that um, it gets talked down because of this perceived dichotomy between logic and emotion. So, you know, Plato talked up logic and logic became the defining thing of the smart human being and emotion became the defining thing of a weak human being. And sadly, although I don't believe in this binary model, it got divided into male and female. Um, and the romance novel was predominantly and is predominantly a female genre. And so there is this hangover, this leftover thing that it is weak and smushy and it is um, predictable in a certain way. If you have read any romance, particularly if you have read any recently, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, there, it is a very, very sophisticated genre and the writers and the readers are 
really, really well versed in what they want, how they want their hero, how they want their heroine written. And um, if you're in any romance groups, you'll see readers asking for particular tropes. They know their tropes um, and they know what they like and they know the feeling that they're going for. So this is the big thing we're driving for this year, right? You've got to get your readers feeling. How do you get them feeling? Yesterday, I was talking about how you make your main protagonist relate relatable. And you don't only make them relatable through their flaw, you make them relatable through their um, positive characteristics and their negative characteristics and their drive to overcome the things that are getting in their way. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on why romance gets talked down. It's a, it's a load of rubbish and people should stop doing it and actually start studying this massive, massive market that has such a wide range. So um, we are on the end of story-driven stuff, right, in romance. Um, but once you get there, you've got to dig even deeper because the different kinds of romance that break out all the way from, um, well... <laughs> If we say kinky is on the end of steamy, through steamy, um, to the moment the door closes. So the, the defining moment between clean, clean and wholesome and steamy is the door. So if you've got hand holding and kissing, that's okay. Anything more than that that happens behind the bedroom door is steamy. It doesn't matter how steamy or what they are experimenting with. All of this is steamy and all of this is clean, clean and wholesome all the way to uh, Christian romance is also a big genre. Um, and, and within these, so you've got this whole span of things that we're looking at from clean to steamy. You've also got um, the subgenres of romance, which are unending from, um, from romantic suspense through... Um, I mean, my brain blanks out, of course, when I start talking, but there are hundreds of subgenres and the readers know what they want. Um, I am not going to name some of the really, really great sites because I don't want people to go trolling. Um, if you are interested in some romance sites, I will um, ask Craig and Elaine's permission to let people PM me so that I can tell you where, if you want to go and join some great reader sites where you can see people basically making a shopping list for what they want. I want Grumpy Sunshine. I want um, Age Gap. I have the following triggers. Now, I've talked a couple of times about triggers in the last couple of days. Um, in romance, you absolutely want to label your triggers. Um, so, you know, surprise baby is a trope that comes up. Well, for some people, that's a trigger. That's a trigger because maybe they lost a baby or maybe they were adopted or maybe, you know, there's something in their family that just makes a surprise baby something painful for them. And in romance, we pay attention to how people are feeling. Um, and the other reason that you want to write triggers down is um, the readers of romance are looking for those reviews that say, for example, this was nothing but smut. I put it down after page 25. And there are hundreds of readers who are like on my list right now um, because it, there is this emotionally invested um, story about love and sex. It depends where we are on the steamy to clean um, um, word, find a word, put the word in. I don't know what the word is. Um, so, so we have got this very, very highly structured storytelling. Uh, I would recommend picking up Gwen Hayes's Romancing the Beat. It's a teeny, teeny, tiny book, but it will tell you all the things that your romance readers must have from you, um, from the meet cute all the way to the happily ever after, the HEA. Um, all right, so we have got, ah, we're already eight minutes in, how did that happen? Um, I want to talk about one of the great stories that has lasted for hundreds of years. And, uh, and if you know me in the real world, you'll know where I'm going. So um, Pride and Prejudice, why does Pride and Prejudice last? And what made it such a great love story? All right. Just looking at my notes, because I do write notes. I know you can't tell, but I am. Um, the the Colin, Colin Firth... Um, wow. Wow, I shouldn't do these past... When the sun is past the yard arm, because I've lost it. Um, 
Para Ilkham Admi, um, the Colin Firth version of Pride and Prejudice, which is the 1995 British um, Broadcasting Corporation version of Pride and Prejudice, um, was the highest selling series for the BBC for decades. Uh, it is still a favourite. I think Line of Duty might have inched it out, um, but I don't know if it's inched it out over time. Uh, and why? Why is it so popular? It's popular for a few reasons. It's popular because it does justice to the book. And one of the reasons that romance is so hard to do on the screen is romance deals with so much more interiority. And interiority is hard to do on the screen. Um, so for, for a lot of romance now, we really, really want to understand the why. Why does this character believe that they are unlovable? Why is this character not allowing themselves to have what they want? Why won't they just go for it? And in romance, you're really, really investigating misbelief in a deep, deep way, both for the hero and for the heroine. Um, and in Pride and Prejudice, we are mostly in the heroine's POV, which for the modern romance novel isn't as usual. Usually, usually, many, many times there is a dual POV. So you know what's going on from both sides. And one of the great things that we've got going on is they misunderstand each other because they can't get inside each other's heads. So we know what she's thinking and hoping and wanting, and we know what he's thinking and hoping and wanting, and they're not communicating it because their misbelief gets in the way. Um, and in Pride and Prejudice, we have got um, Elizabeth Bennet, who is determined in the beginning. She tells us that she is determined to marry for love because she has seen her parents' loveless marriage. I think that Mr. Bennett is just a fascinating character. Um, there, there is a moment in the BBC adaptation where he says, um, um, many men have married beauty. And you worry, you know, is that why he married Mrs. Bennett? Was she a great beauty? She says she was a great beauty, and she said that she was one of the great dancers in her youth um, of the county, and he regrets it. He clearly regrets it. He loves his daughters, although, you know, he's quite cruel to them in some ways. I'd love to see a case study of Mr. Bennett. Um, we don't see a lot of what Darcy does. A lot of what Darcy does is off the page. And so Elizabeth continues to dislike him and malign him and malign him to other people and talk him down. She talks to her aunt and uncle who have a wonderful marriage that she admires. Um, and when they go and they visit Pemberley, her aunt is still talking about Darcy being so proud and being somebody who, you know, is quite horrible to other people and who treated poor Wickham. Mr. Wickham, of course, is the villain of the piece, but doesn't look like the villain of the piece. He looks like someone who's been mistreated by Mr. Darcy. And Elizabeth continues to believe that. But unbeknownst to us, Darcy has listened to what Elizabeth said. So one of the great, great proposal scenes in literature I mean, the other really great one is in Persuasion, which, you know, is just wonderful. One of the best letters ever written in literature. But in PMP, uh, he, he proposes to Elizabeth and, um, and he tells her what he has had to do to overcome himself. He lays out his struggle that, you know, my family will disapprove of this. Our, our families are in quite, quite different strata. And that, that's hard to see now because they just all look like rich people to us. But he is part of basically the landed gentry. He is a billionaire. This is a billionaire romance. Um, and she is solidly middle class. And th that division is also really, really important because there is a real barrier for him that is quite hard to see for the modern reader. And he lays out why he has had to fight to come overcome these things. And when she says, why would I do that? Um, he, he says, well, why wouldn't you? And she says, you ruined my sister's happiness. Because, of course, he tried to get his best friend not to marry Elizabeth's sister because of the class divide and because he believed that Jane Bennett was indifferent to his friend. So he's got love going on in his mind and he is kind of trying to protect his friend, but there's a lot of snobbery going on in there. And Elizabeth berates him and she tells him that nothing, nothing would induce me to marry you. You are the least gentlemanly gentleman I have ever met. 
And what we don't know until the very end, again, just this wonderful, wonderful plotting by Jane, is that he has been thinking about that. He has been thinking about that and reflecting on himself and thinking about what it means to be a gentleman and what it means to have the privilege that he has. And then when Elizabeth, Bennet's sister, runs away uh, and throws herself at Wickham, who is this cad who um, takes advantage of young women, she ruins not only her own reputation, but Lydia has ruined her entire family's reputation. And when Elizabeth Bennet tells Mr. Darcy, um, when Fitzwilliam Darcy, uh, when she tells Darcy that her sister has thrown herself upon uh, Wickham's mercy, basically they've run away, they've eloped. She's now a ruined, fallen woman. The whole family is now disgraced. And Elizabeth, because she believes, because her prejudice makes her believe that Darcy has no regard for her, believes that she'll never see him again. And he, I'm going to cry again. <laughs> he secretly goes away and does what no other men in the family can do. Um, he goes away and he finds Elizabeth's sister. He forces, he buys Wickham, he pays the cad to marry the girl he has ruined. He forces a marriage so that her reputation is saved, so that Elizabeth Bennet's family is saved, and so that Elizabeth is saved. And he does it all without telling her and forcing the people who know about it into silence. So it's this silent virtue thing that he does. Um, I posted something on my own timeline, which I will post in here as well, that is a, a psychologist's analysis of Darcy and what he has done in that moment um, by putting someone before him rather than instead of him. It's a very, very interesting take on what selfless love means and how selfless love doesn't necessarily need to mean a merging or a co-addictive giving up of oneself, but rather a putting before instead of putting instead. It is, yeah, we're going to go along. Um, so, so we find out only at the very, very end, um, Elizabeth's sister trips up and inadvertently tells her that Darcy was at her wedding to Mr. Wickham. And Elizabeth is dumbfounded. How could he be this proud, strange man who maybe showed me a different side to himself when I saw him in his, his natural environment where everyone around him was talking about this gentle, protective soul who does great things and treats his um, everyone on his estate very well and treats all the servants very well. Who is that who was so proud and off? putting and rude when he uh, proposed to her and she writes to her aunt and says you know what was going on and her aunt breaks her silence of course because we're in romance um, and um, Darcy in his in this thing that he is doing which is listening to the woman that he loves reflecting on what it means about himself and going away and doing the internal work that is necessary to make himself a better gentleman. He has no hope of winning her. He believes that she does not love him and will not love him, but he has embarked upon this bettering of self because of what she said to him and because he's in love. Story, 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 story. I, I mean, there's tons of id stuff in there as well. Um, but I want to get on to two other takes on Pride and Prejudice that tell us more about what, how this is related to misbelief and why it's so compelling for readers. Why this, this study of why is so compelling to the right side of the brain. So... Um, Darcy, in this, this press to make himself a better person, confesses to his best friend, Bingley, that he deliberately um, took him away from Jane Bennett, who Mr. Bingley was in love with, um, took him away from Jane Bennett and lied about her being in London when she came to see the family. And, uh, and Bingley still, because Bingley is, uh, he is, is what's called a, a cinnamon roll character, lovely, squishy, sweet, sweet, sweet man. Um, he's a good man. He, uh, he still wants his best friend's blessing on this marriage. 
Uh, and there's lots of stuff in there about duty and the division between duty and desire, uh, which is so, so, so important. Even in the modern world, it's still important. We still do our duty. We still do what we must rather than what we wish we could. Everyone who's getting up at five o'clock in the morning to write before the kids get up, everybody who's coming home and waiting till everyone goes to bed and sneaking an hour in are putting love before desire because you want to write your books, but you are taking care of the people who rely on you and who love you, and making sure that you still have this loving unit that you're pouring energy into. It's still something that we do, even though we're supposed to be in this hedonistic time where we please ourselves. We really, truly do not. And these romances speak to the division between duty and desire. Bingley rushes back to Jane. Um, tells her that he loves her, they get engaged, and Darcy trails along behind and sees Elizabeth. Now, um, there's a subplot piece where Lady Catherine de Verg, who is um, Darcy's aunt, goes and challenges Elizabeth. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful battle of wits. It is not surprising that Jane Austen said Elizabeth was the favourite character that she had ever written, and anybody who didn't like uh, Elizabeth Bennet was basically a fool because she had... She had spunk and verve and uh, she had presence. And one of the things about Elizabeth Bennet is she knows her own mind. She is a wonderful kind of character in the history of literature. Um, Darcy once again proposes to Elizabeth. So he puts himself out there emotionally. He makes himself extremely vulnerable and says, my feelings haven't changed. If you don't love me, I will never speak of it again. Maximum respect. Maximum respect. None of the toxic stuff that so many of our young men were taught, which was, she's going to reject you, try again, try again, try again, which it just leads to all kinds of problems. Jane understood, <laughs> even, even that many years ago, how long ago was it? She understood that respect boundary that is at the best kind of love. He says, if you tell me that I... Am rejected, I will never speak of it again. And she says, my feelings are the opposite. <laughs> I really am crying now. <laughs> so the two other takes that I want to talk to you about um, are um, Death Comes to Pemberley, P.D. James's Death Comes to Pemberley. A really great adaptation was made. And one of the great things in Death Comes to Pemberley um, is it's after the happy ever after. And Darcy and Elizabeth are together, but it turns out that their misbeliefs are still in play. I really recommend watching this if you want to understand how misbelief doesn't really ever go away. This is why the novel is so crucial, because the novel is this packaged piece of art where the character overcomes the misbelief and we have hope, having walked in their shoes, we have hope that you can overcome your misbelief. But in real life, what happens is you overcome it and then you get another test and you have to overcome it again. And it's a spiral. It's definitely a spiral, but you have to come it over multiple times. And P.D. James deals with that. So um, Mr. Wickham in P.D. James's Death Comes to Pemberley um, sh shoots his best friend or it appears that he shot his best friend. And so he and Lydia Lydia Bennett, now Lydia Wickham, are coming to Pemberley where Darcy and Elizabeth are really happy. It opens and they're happy and they've got a kid and their life is wonderful and they talk about how much they love each other and they are getting ready for the ball uh, and then scandal comes. Scandal comes to Pemberley with a dead body. Uh, and and then we see then we see how easy it is for Elizabeth and Darcy to still believe what they believe about the other person, possibly not really loving them. So in Elizabeth's case, she remembers overhearing people at last year's ball saying that she's basically a gold digger and beneath him, and of course he doesn't really love her. And and Darcy overhears Lydia saying, well, Elizabeth was a gold digger. She married him for the money. And they get separated. They get separated by what the other people around them say. And there is this wonderful scene where Elizabeth is digging into the mystery. She is doing some of the plot stuff in finding out maybe somebody else um, killed uh, Wickham's best friend. 
and she is doing the digging into that, which is a really wonderful reversal, um, gender reversal for who is doing the investigating. Um, and Darcy is in the woods looking at a grave and the grave marker is for a Darcy. So it's somebody in his family and he won't talk about it. He runs away and won't talk about it. And Elizabeth goes to Georgiana, his younger sister, and says, who is buried in the woods? And Georgiana says, we never speak of it. We never speak of it. This was my great grandfather. He gambled Pemberley away and then he committed suicide and he is buried in shame and he almost lost everything. And everyone who lives on the estate, their livelihoods are, are locked into Pembley being a working concern. It's how people made their living. It's how they lived their lives in village life was the great house provided jobs for all these people. And Georgiana says to Elizabeth, you do not understand what it means to be a Darcy. You do not understand that duty must come first. And in that moment, you understand so much more about what Darcy has had to overcome. Um, and the other one that I would I'd point you to work towards is called Lost in Austin, which I've talked about before and I've sent to a couple of people as gifts. So Lost in Austin is a time travel portal story where um, the character is a modern woman who goes through a portal and it exchanges places with Elizabeth Bennett. Now we're really, really over time. Um, and she is determined, she's read Pride and Prejudice, it's her favourite book, and she is determined to get Elizabeth back there because Elizabeth is supposed to fall in love with Darcy. And Darcy and Elizabeth's love story is the greatest love story ever told. Um, and you can imagine what happens and how that unfolds. But the important moment in that for Darcy and his misbelief and the writer's understanding that Darcy says, I am a public person. I am not permitted a private persona. Anybody who has seen me smiled is lying. And it's in a private moment when Elizabeth and he's explaining to her what it means to be an aristocrat in that time and how much he loves her because she can see him. It goes actually much, much, much deeper than that. So what have we got? We've got much, much, much more story how it impacts your main protagonist's usually two now, and plot. The plot is much smaller part, much, much easier to describe plot in romance because how it impacts them, how they respond, how they feel, what's going on for them is the much bigger part of the novel. All right. I want you to tell me in the comment section on the Facebook page um, if you would like to, to win this matching pair of magic rocks, I would like to tell you, you to tell me, because I've already told you what I think, what your hero and heroine's warring misbeliefs are. If you're writing a romance, I want you to tell me, there are going to be two winners because I forgot to do one yesterday. I want you to tell me what your H and H's warring misbeliefs are. What are the misbeliefs that keep them apart? All right. See you tomorrow.